Okay, I think that uh, we can start now. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone again. Um, uh, we are again very excited to continue with this uh, seminar series. Uh, and uh, I'm Elina Zuniga from the University of California, San Diego, and I'm here with Dr. Carla Rodlin, the co-organizer of the Global Immuno Talks, and our great speaker today, uh, Caetano Reyes Osa from the Francis Crick Institute. So, uh, very briefly, uh, uh, as a reminder, and also for the people that uh, are joining for the first time, I would like to go uh, quickly through the goals that we would like to accomplish with this seminar series. And remember, we would like to benefit and inspire immunologists across the world in an egalitarian manner. And for that, we are committed to make these talks accessible for free. We are recording the talks and uploading them in YouTube uh, with the, in the channel Global Immuno Talks. And so anyone with a uh, conflicting scheduling uh, can still in benefit from the talks. And we are making the discussion virtual and the questions and answer contingent to speaker availability will be done via Twitter with the hashtag Global Immunity. In addition, we would like to increase opportunities for scientific learning without traveling. And so we are hoping this will be accommodating for people that have travel restrictions and also uh, be uh, allow learning in an environmentally friendly manner. And so in, in summary, what we would like with these talks is to provide opportunities for learning in an egalitarian manner in an inclusive manner and in an environmentally friendly manner. And we have uh, great news to share. So the, the, the response for these global immunotalks has been amazing. And so when we analyze the uh, data for the number of people that have attended the live or recorded form of the first talks, there were 4,000 people uh, that benefited from this talk. This is an amazing number. And also when we look at the uh, um, uh, people that connected to the live talks only, that were uh, connecting for 48 different countries. And so these are here in dark green and you can see that really this is a global initiative. So uh, we would like to thank all of you for joining either the live or the recorded version of the talks. Uh, and all of the ones that spread the word uh, so more and more can benefit across the world. And uh, of course, uh, we would also like to thank the speakers that made uh, this initiative possible. Uh, all the speakers that are listed here and other speakers that we are currently scheduling for the following months. So thank you so much for your generosity and for your participation. And last but not least, I would like to wish everyone a happy International Day of Immunology. Uh, this is a great day to celebrate and be grateful that we are uh, working and doing research in immunology. And also a great day to advocate uh, for the importance uh, of immunology uh, to combat uh, cancer, autoimmunity, infectious diseases, allergy, etc. So uh, happy International Day of Immunology to everyone. And so Carla now will introduce Caetano. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you so much for those wonderful uh, words. It is my real pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Caetano Reyes Sosa. Now, Caetano is a senior group leader and assistant research director at the Crick, where he also heads the immunobiology laboratory. But we mostly know him as a world leader in dendritic cells. So we are delighted to have you uh, Cayetano with us today. I think we are really uh, ready for, again, an excellent uh, scientific talk where we are going to learn about cells and pathways in immunity to cancer and infection. Now, as Elina said, we celebrate the International Day of Immunology today. And I think in a way we also celebrate the multiple connections that all of us scientists across the world have. And in that way, I want to celebrate a special connection that I have with Cayetano as a dear former trainee of mine, uh, Marca Besa Cabrerizo, who I hope is 
listening now, uh, went on to do her PhD with Cayetano. So that's a very special relationship we have. Now, continuing with the international theme, uh, Cayetano works in the UK and is a native of Portugal. So Cayetano, before starting your talk, um, I'd like to ask you a question. And the question is, uh, what is the most difficult question and at the same time, the easiest question that an Argentinian like me can ask a Portuguese like you? Well, I guess uh, that question is whether we understand each other, given that <laughs> similarity in our languages. Uh, of That's a, a very, very nice uh, point. Um, thank, you, thank you, Gaetano. I also uh, think we share passion for soccer, I guess. Uh, so maybe I don't have to elaborate more on the question, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on who is the best uh, world soccer player, uh, player currently. Uh, and I guess we don't have to go into more details because we know what the answer is. So uh, with this, uh, I'd like to turn the mic onto you and uh, you know, get started with your talk. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Carla, and, and thank you, Elena. It's a great uh, honor and a pleasure to be addressing such a, a distinguished uh, audience throughout the world today. Uh, and so happy uh, Immunology Day uh, to uh, all of you. Uh, and so what I thought I would do today is actually use this as an opportunity uh, to uh, tell you a little bit about the work uh, that my lab has been carrying out uh, over the last few years. Uh, and what I thought I would do is really give you a broad overview uh, and I will be uh, rather thin on detail uh, but the work that I'm going to talk about is largely published, and so if you're interested in that detail, I would encourage you uh, to go and look at the original papers. And so by way of introduction, I just want to remind everyone that we can think of immunity as a fairly uh, simple uh, homeostatic type circuit uh, in which uh, a insult needs to be <laughs> detected in order to put in place a response that ultimately neutralizes that insult. Of course, in the case of the immune system, uh, the uh, insults that we are dealing with are infection, uh, cancer, and also tissue damage. And the interest of my lab for many years has been in trying to understand the sensing aspect of this circuit. And we work at two levels. Uh, we think about the cells that are involved uh, in sensing insults, and they include specialized immune cells such as dendritic cells uh, and many others. Uh, they also include non-immune cells. In fact, practically every cell in our body can serve as a, a sensor cell uh, in one or another situation. And the other level at which we operate is thinking about the sensor molecules that are involved in these cell types. So I want to start talking uh, uh, about uh, this uh, uh, equation that you see here uh, in the context of uh, cancer. Uh, and just to remind everyone, we now uh, recognize that uh, T cells uh, can destroy cancers, but cancers very often put up a shield that prevents uh, that uh, destruction by a T cell, so-called checkpoint. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, we now have therapeutics uh, called checkpoint blockade uh, immunotherapy agents that can uh, destroy these chi shields and restore uh, immune control of tumors uh, by uh, T cells. Now, as an immunologist, what this effectively tells me uh, is that at least in some patients, there is such a thing as anti-tumor immunity uh, that therefore must have been initiated at some stage. And so one of the questions that has intrigued us and many others is how is it this anti-tumor immunity is initiated? And with our thinking that dendritic cells are key antigen presenting cells in driving effective T cell responses, uh, we would suppose that there must be some uh, interactions between tumor cells and dendritic cells. Uh, 
uh, although some of these interactions may also be indirect and involve additional cell types. Now, in addition to these considerations, one might also pose the question whether in addition to evading the attention of primed anti-tumor T cells by putting up a, a checkpoint a, a blockade, uh, so by putting up checkpoint uh, uh, molecules, uh, whether tumors can also evade the attention uh, uh, in these initial steps that would lead to the priming of those effective T cells in the first place. <clears throat> and so our uh, thoughts along the, these lines came from uh, the uh, uh, observation that had already been made by uh, many others uh, that quite a few tumors upregulate cyclooxygenases, uh, which are enzymes that can metabolize arachidonic acid into prostanoids. And one of these uh, key prostanoids uh, is uh, prostaglandin E2 uh, that can be uh, actively secreted by uh, many types of cancer. And uh, we uh, went on to do some experiments, uh, one of which is uh, summarized uh, here. Uh, and talking about links to Argentina, this was work carried out by an Argentinian uh, who was uh, in my lab a few years ago and now is independent in Manchester, at Santiago Zelenay. Uh, and uh, in these experiments, uh, we deleted cyclooxygenases uh, from uh, tumor cell lines, for example, here a melanoma cell line. And what I think you can see is that these cells, when they're now implanted uh, into a host, they can be controlled, uh, but this is clearly dependent on TNB cells in, because these cells grow perfectly well in a Reg deficient host, much like the parental cells which are able to produce prostaglandin E2 and don't really care about uh, the adaptive immune system. Uh, and we went on to show that this was really due to prostaglandin E2 uh, and that in addition to manipulating the system genetically, we could also think about manipulating it pharmacologically, for example, by using COX inhibitors, cyclooxygenase inhibitors such as aspirin. Uh, and you can see here, uh, that uh, aspirin does synergize with checkpoint blockade, in this case, anti-PD-1 blockade, uh, in the control of tumors, uh, leading to uh, uh, more rapid uh, control. Uh, and that's also seen in the time it takes to reject these tumors. And from uh, this work uh, and many other pieces of data, uh, we came to the conclusion that a major immunomodulator made by some tumor cells is prostaglandin E2, uh, which uh, can do a number of different things. One is that it can actually fuel a type of inflammation that is propitious for tumor growth. But at the same time, it also blocks the type of inflammation that leads to anti-tumor immunity uh, that can actually lead to tumor rejection. And therefore, if you intervene to try and get rid of this prostaglandin E2 axis, you can now restore this type of immunity that allows for tumor control. Now, I started off by saying that we were interested in dendritic cells, uh, but in fact, dendritic cells are indeed one of the targets of prostaglandin E2 in the system, although by no means the only target. Uh, and in order to start to tell you a bit more about that, I need to remind you that when we talk about dendritic cells, we're in fact thinking uh, about uh, a whole a family of cells. Uh, these are now uh, often called conventional uh, dendritic cells, and those are the ones that we are concerned with today. And in particular, we are concerned with this uh, type of conventional dendritic cell here that I'm going to call a conventional DC type 1, uh, which, uh, as you may know, is a type uh, of uh, dendritic cell that depends uh, for its development on the transcription factor BATF3, uh, as uh, initially uh, noticed by Ken Murphy, who went on to show uh, that, in fact, uh, if you do not have DC1 in these BATF3 knockout mice, you are unable to control immunogenic tumors, and that's what's shown uh, in uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, experiment taken uh, from uh, Cannes' paper. And that went on to be confirmed by a very large number of groups uh, that effectively helped to establish this general paradigm uh, 
that DC1 are non-redundant for immune control of immunogenic tumors. And that is also true in our tumors that in which we've ablated prostaglandin E2 production uh, and we've now made them able to be controlled by uh, the immune system. And one of the things that we noticed was very interesting uh, in, uh, these, in this model is that these COX deficient tumors that are eventually going to be controlled by the immune system, unlike the parental ones, already very, very early on after implantation, show a difference in the number of and frequency of DC1s that they contain. So this looked like an ideal system in which to dissect what might control the accumulation of DC1s in tumors, because effectively we have identical tumors other than the fact that these have had a genetic deletion in cyclooxygenase and therefore cannot make prostaglandin E2. Now, it's not just the accumulation that differs, but in fact also the penetration of the tumors by the DC1s that make it in. So this is a COX deficient tumor, and you can see here uh, that uh, you, not only it has many more of these red profiles of DC1s, but they're also further into the tumor uh, compared to the parental tumor that makes prostaglandin E2. And so we started to look at what other things might differ at these very early uh, time points. Uh, and at these very early time points, you still do not have a very large difference in T cells. Uh, this will become much more marked as these tumors grow. And eventually that's what will lead to the immune control of these tumors. But already at these early time points, in addition to DC1s, you also see another innate immune cell that is differing markedly in content, and that's the NK cell. And in fact, DC1s and NK cells are often found in close proximity within these tumors. These are the blue NK cells and the red DC1s, and you can appreciate that they appear to almost be talking to each other. And that almost suggests to us that perhaps the accumulation of uh, DC1s might be controlled by NK cells. And that turns out to be the case. And we can show that, for example, in this experiment, where if we deplete NK cells using antibodies, irrespective of the presence of T and B cells, you see a decrease in DC1s. I'm not showing you the data, but the converse is not true. NK cells still make it into these tumors, irrespective of the presence of DC1s. Now, this uh, would maybe suggest that NK cells are making chemokines or some other factor that can bring in DC1s into the tumors. And so we looked at two chemokines in particular, CCL5 and XCL1. Now XCL1 incidentally is a chemokine ligand for a receptor called XCR1, which is extraordinarily restricted in its expression to DC1 and if very often is used as a marker for DC1 across species. And it's interesting to note that both XCL1 and CCL5 are very dependent on NK cells for their production within these tumors. So if you deplete NK cells, you see a loss of signal for these two chemokines. And the reason why we focus on these two is that if we block them using blocking antibodies, and we have to block them both incidentally because of redundancy, then we see a reduction in the accumulation of these DC1s. So it looks like we have here a system whereby an innate immune cell, the NK cell, is effectively producing chemokines that control uh, the accumulation of another innate immune cell, the DC1, that then couples to the adaptive immune system, and that this somehow is being subverted by prostaglandin E2 in those tumors that make that prostanoid. Now, this is all in mouse models. Does this actually make any difference to uh, cancer patients? Uh, the only way that we can do these types of analysis is by looking at correlations. And so one of the correlations that we did uh, was to derive gene signatures for NK cells, for DC1s, and also for the three chemokines that we are concerned with. And I'm saying three chemokines because in humans, there's a paralog of XCL1 
that is called XCL2. And what you can see here is in this correlative analysis that in skin cutaneous melanoma, in breast cancer, head and neck, and lung adenocarcinoma, all of these three signatures cross-correlate. And that will be consistent with uh, these uh, NK cells making the chemokines that bring in the DC1s. Does this actually make a difference in terms of uh, disease outcome? Uh, well, one of the ways in which we can try to look at this is to actually analyze a patient's survival where we've stratified patients in terms of these signatures. So we're looking at the top quartile versus the bottom quartile here for the NK cell signature. And you can see that in all cases, uh, the, the top quartile does better in terms of overall survival than the bottom quartile. And the same thing is true for uh, DC1s. Uh, and I should add that uh, these data uh, have also uh, been uh, uh, published by uh, other groups who've uh, similarly seen that uh, a DC1 signature correlates positively uh, with overall survival. And so without taking much longer, uh, I just thought I would summarize not only uh, our experiments, uh, but those of uh, many other groups that have been working uh, in this area, notably uh, the groups uh, of Max Krummel, of Tom Gajewski, of Miriam Mera, Mikhail Pite, Lisa Cousins, and, uh, and many others. And so what we seem to have here is a type of dendritic cell that is playing a key role in the tumor microenvironment. And it's probably doing two things. One is picking up tumor antigens to transport to the draining lymph node where it can then prime naive CD8 T cells uh, to generate effectors that then make it into the tumor. But in fact, these dendritic cells can also make chemokines that directly bring in these effector T cells uh, and they can respond to the interferon gamma made by these T cells to actually produce IL-12, which helps re-stimulate these T cells in situ. And they probably also locally present antigen to these T cells. Now, it looks like they are in an intimate relationship with NK cells and perhaps other innate lymphocytes uh, that actually make the chemokines that bring in the DC1s into the tumor in the first place, uh, possibly also then result precursors into this microenvironment. And as shown by Max Crummel, these uh, NK cells can also make a, a, a growth factors such as flit through ligand that help sustain uh, and amplify these DC1s. Now, tumors appear to have learned uh, the, uh, about this axis, uh, and uh, in fact, they can make prostaglandin E2, they can actually subvert uh, the activity of these NK cells and the recruitment of these DC1s. It can also actually subvert the uh, function of the few DC1s that make it into these tumors by reducing the production of IL-12. And of course, we shouldn't forget that prostaglandin E2 acts on many, many other cell types. And it can also directly act on these effective CD8 T cells uh, and contribute to inhibition of their activity as so shown very nicely uh, by uh, Sue Keach uh, and others. And so uh, we've become uh, uh, generally interested uh, in this area and it's still an area of uh, active research in my lab. But I think it brings in a more general point, which has to do uh, with dendritic cells being attracted to tissues, not only tumors, uh, but also all tissues where they perform their sentinel uh, function. And that's what I want to discuss with you next. Uh, and as you know, the reason why we have these dendritic cells in all tissues is so that they can effectively uh, sam sample their microenvironment. You can see that uh, here uh, with these cells in the meninges of the brain that extend and retract uh, processes uh, and can uh, therefore uh, serve to uh, cover uh, that whole space should something go wrong and thereby perform a sentinel function. Now this begs the question of how is it that these cells uh, make it into tissues. Uh, and as you probably all know, they are leukocytes. Uh, 
uh, and therefore they are born in the bone marrow. And this is the point at which you get commitment to the dendritic cell lineage, the so-called common uh, or conventional DC precursor. And then you've got this pre-dendritic cell, which is the cell that exits the bone marrow, travels through the blood and enters tissues. And therefore, it would seem that the number of dendritic cells in tissues uh, will be largely controlled by this seeding of the tissues by the pre-dendritic cells, which is something uh, that we still understand relatively little about. And also, we do not know to what extent this is just a steady state uh, process or one that is actually responsive uh, to demand, for example, when those tissues uh, are under stress. Uh, from infection, cancer, or other insults. So we decided to start to study this by using a genetic model in which uh, we try not to perturb the system with any type of cell transfer. And that takes advantage of the fact that at this point of commitment to the dendritic cell uh, lineage, uh, we actually have uh, the, the expression of a uh, receptor uh, called DNGR1, also known as CLEC9A. And what this effectively means is that if you generate a lineage tracer model in which you put Cre recombinase under the control of the CLEC9A locus and you cross uh, these mice to a classic fate reporter, then at the point at which these dendritic cell progenitors in bone marrow start to express DNGR1, they also start to express Cre recombinase, which can now excise a stop cassette allowing for, in this case, a tandem tomato expression from the Rosa 26 locus. And this is an indelible recombination event that gets transmitted to the progeny uh, of these cells. Uh, and therefore, the cells that now leave the bone marrow and enter the circulation and enter tissues are all expressing this tandem tomato, and you can see them uh, in uh, various tissues. Now, this is not by any means a, a perfect system. None of these lineage tracing systems are ever perfect. Uh, it has uh, some caveats, including incomplete penetrance, but it does allow us to do some very nice analysis, as I hope uh, you will agree uh, from the next few slides. And so one of uh, these analyses uh, is that in fact of, instead of just marking the progeny of dendritic cell progenitors with a single fluorescent reporter, we can think about marking it with four different reporters in a stochastic fashion. And that takes advantage of the confetti mouse that was developed by Hans Klevers uh, based on the Brainbow cassette. Uh, and why would you uh, ever want to do this? Uh, the reason that we thought this might be interesting is that it could now allow us to look at the pattern that is utilized by pre-DCs as they colonize tissues. So here's an example in pictorial form of what I mean. You could envisage on the left that these pre-dendritic cells would just enter a tissue like the intestine, uh, and they would uh, just colonize that space in a random manner, leading to an intermixing of the colors. But you could also think that perhaps these cells actually enter a niche and they actually can proliferate, leading to uh, discrete clones, which we would observe by the fact that we would have little clusters of single color dendritic cells. And so that's one of the questions that we set out to address uh, by uh, looking uh, in uh, these uh, CLEC9A CRE. Uh, uh, mice crossed to the Rosa 26 confetti, the mice that we call in CLEC 9A confetti. And here's an example indeed of the small intestine where the white shows ecoderin staining, delineating the epithelial layer. And what I hope you can see is that you've got each of the different fluorophores represented. Uh, you can see these discrete cells that correspond to the dendritic cells that are in the lamina propria, which is where they should be. And it's perhaps easier if I rotate the image and show this in uh, this movie here. And I think you can begin to appreciate that within individual villi, and you've got individual lamina propria colonized by these uh, dendritic cells. And very often it looks like you've got clusters of single collar. Uh, dendritic cells, which would be consistent with a pattern uh, 
uh, similar to the one that I described that will be obtained by local clonal expansion. Now, this can also be seen in other organs. Here's the lung, where you can see the airways delineated by autofluorescence. And now that it goes away, you can also see these clusters of dendritic cells. And once again, they appear to be very often organized by color. Now, just to convince you that these really are dendritic cells, we've crossed these mice onto a FLT3 ligand knockout background. FLT3 ligand is essential for dendritic cell development and consistent with the fact that, that we're dealing with dendritic cells, pretty much all the labeled profiles disappear. So how do we now look at these images and convince ourselves that perhaps that single color clustering that we think we see is real? And for that, we need to do a, some mathematical analysis. Uh, and we collaborated with Frederick Clauschen in Berlin, uh, who suggested a clever means of converting these labeled shapes uh, into mathematical uh, 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 entities called Voronoi polyhedrons. Uh, and what this allows us to do is represent each of the colored dendritic cells by a Voronoi shape. Uh, that is colored according to the fluorophore that we had detected in the dendritic cell. But what we can now do is respecting the actual positioning of these Voronois, we can shuffle all the colors around many, many times and compare what we observed with this simulated scenario. And what you can see here is irrespective of what, whether you look at the number of single color clusters per uh, uh, as a frequency of total cells or the percentage of cells in clusters or the togetherness, compactness of uh, these uh, uh, single color clusters. In all cases, the observed scenario is statistically significantly different from the simulated scenario, which tells us that this pattern could not have been obtained by chance. And therefore, it is truly reflective of a clone of sister dendritic cells. And that now allows us to ask some additional questions, such as the one depicted on this slide. Uh, we know that there are at least two basic types of conventional dendritic cells arising from pre-dendritic cells. Is it that these pre-dendritic cells already leave the bone marrow knowing that they're going to give rise to either DC1 or DC2? And there is evidence for that from the groups of Florent Gignoux and from the groups of Ken Murphy. Or is it that, in fact, you've still got some uncommitted or many uncommitted pre-dendritic cells uh, that uh, are bipotential and can give rise to uh, either subset? And so to look at that, we've got to go back to our images and look at these clusters of single color uh, dendritic cells. And now, put in as many markers as we can to try and figure out what kind of dendritic cells they are, a DC1 or a DC2. Uh, and once we do that, we can then ask if all of the cells in the same cluster are of one or the other type. So I'll give you an example. Here's a cluster of red dendritic cells. And it turns out that they are all DC2. We call this a pure cluster because all the cells are of the same subset. Here's a cluster of uh, uh, cyan positive cells, and they are all DC1s based on the markers that they express. And if we do this iteratively, uh, we can effectively come to the conclusion that interestingly, in most cases, these clusters are composed of a single type of uh, dendritic cell. And so the conclusions that we would draw from this is that in fact, these pre-dendritic cells and their immediate progeny, their dendritic cells, can proliferate after uh, the pre-dendritic cell has entered these non-lymphoid organs. Uh, we, I didn't show you the actual proliferation data, uh, but we can actually look at cell cycle in these cells. Uh, and because they can proliferate, they actually give rise to mini clones of sister cells that arise contemporaneously uh, from a pre-dendritic cell. And that's what we see as a single color cluster. Uh, and in fact, this, most of these clones are of a single DC subset, which would argue that that pre-dendritic cell was largely uh, committed 
uh, and then its progeny is also committed to the DC subset to which it belongs. In other words, our tissues are actually a very fine mosaic of little mini clones of sister dendritic cells, but normally we do not see that fine grain unless we do this type of analysis. Now, this is all in a steady state. Uh, so the obvious question is, what happens if you move away from the steady state, if you challenge these tissues? And so we chose to do influenza A virus infection uh, of uh, lungs. Uh, and one of the things that we observed, which in fact had been reported before, uh, is that uh, the number of dendritic cells in tissues uh, is not fixed. It can actually augment when you've got a challenge such as infection. And you can see that here for both DC1s and DC2s, numbers going up uh, during the course of infection. Although you can also appreciate that there's a lot of variability uh, in each uh, group. Uh, and that is uh, also probably in part due to the fact uh, that these are dynamic tissues uh, in which cells are not uh, just augmenting in number, but also at the same time uh, leaving the tissue to actually go to the draining uh, lymph node to where they then prime T cells. So the obvious question is what supports this expansion of these dendritic cells? And is it really that clonal expansion that we had observed in the steady state? So are we just proliferating a lot more and forming very large clones of dendritic cells to make up for this increase in numbers? Uh, and so the real question is to what extent this single color clustering changes upon challenge. And in order to look at that, we need to look at the foci of infection in the lung because influenza virus infection is patchy. So you've got foci such as the orange one here where we're staining for viral proteins, uh, where there's lots of infected cells. And then there are places further away where you see many fewer infected cells. And in fact, the dendritic cells are predominantly found at these places where you've got uh, these uh, uh, clusters of infected cells. So that's where you really see that increase in numbers over the steady state. But interestingly, if we now do our uh, single color clustering analysis in these lungs from infected mice, whether we look at what we call areas of high infiltration, which are adjacent to where you've got virally infected cells or areas of low infiltration, which are areas further away from the foci of infection. Whether you look at one or the other area, in all cases, what you now find is that your observed scenario is no longer statistically significantly different from the simulated scenario. In other words, you've now got a random distribution and you no longer have this single color clustering so you seem to have lost this clonality. Now, some of that, as I mentioned, may be that the cells are leaving to go to the draining lymph nodes. But this is also in the face of this expansion. So what is really going on? Now, one of the interesting points is that when you infect these mice with influenza virus, you see a large influx of these pre-dendritic cells into the lung. Now, pre-dendritic cells are very rare in tissues. You hardly measure them uh, in uh, non-infected mice, but you can clearly see that they've gone up in response to the infection. And that is at the expense of the pre-dendritic cells in the bone marrow, where there's a transient decrease, which is accompanied by the uh, increase of these cells in the blood. And so this indicates that in fact, these tissues uh, are recruiting pre-dendritic cells from the bone marrow via the blood, and that's how they make up this increase in numbers. And so to put that into words, it looks like infection and probably other challenges lead to an increase in conventional dendritic cells in tissues. Uh, they see demand that is not met by increased proliferation of the cells that were already there or their precursors, Rather, it is met by communication to the bone marrow, asking for an increased efflux of predendritic cells that then can travel to the affected tissues. 
and we're calling this emergency diseases. And I think that this ability of tissues to call for dendritic cell backup is a very interesting feature that perhaps has not been previously appreciated. And we are interested in understanding what it means in terms of the actual immune response that ensues. So I want to uh, leave uh, this part of the talk uh, and move on to another one that relates to this particular uh, DNGR1 uh, molecule that we have been using in these experiments as a genetic uh, tracer for pre-dendritic cells. Uh, so it uh, turns out that it is not just a convenient marker uh, for these uh, precursors. Uh, it is a, a bona fide cell surface receptor of the C-type lectin superfamily. Uh, and uh, it is, in fact, a dimeric receptor stabilized by a disulfide bond. Uh, and it has the c type lectin like domain. That's why it is part of the c type lectin superfamily, uh, which is where it binds to a ligand. Uh, and that is then followed by a neck region, a transmembrane portion, and a tyrosine-based signaling motif that we call a hemitam motif. Now, I've mentioned that the NGR1, also known as CLEC9A, is expressed on dendritic cell precursors, and that's what has allowed us to do this type of lineage tracing that I've just discussed with you. But, in fact, uh, then the NGR1 is also very highly expressed, in fact, much more highly than in precursors, very highly expressed in this DC1 uh, subtype of dendritic cells that we've already discussed a little bit earlier. Uh, and in fact, for that reason, uh, that uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, lineage tracing approach that I showed you uh, has a disproportionate representation uh, in the DC1 compartment compared to the DC2 compartment. Uh, and uh, the NGR1 appears to be a universal marker for DC1 across species much like that chemokine receptor that we've also mentioned, XCR1. Now, if you look at just the NGR1 expression uh, in the context of cancer survival, and you do that type of analysis where you look at the upper quartile versus the bottom quartile, you can see that this single marker uh, in all cases appears to segregate patients' uh, overall survival. Uh, and that's the uh, red lines here that represent the top quartile versus the black lines that represent the bottom quartile. Now, this may simply mean that uh, the NGR1 is a very faithful marker for DC1, as I've mentioned, and therefore this is no different from the earlier analysis that I showed you of a DC1 signature. However, it could also mean that perhaps it is more than that, and perhaps the NGR1 in DC1 is carrying out a function that is also uh, relevant to anti-cancer immunity, uh, and that is an area that is under active investigation in the lab. And one reason for thinking that is that we think that anti-cancer immunity in many cases is elicited when cancer cells die and can be sampled by DC1, which can then present antigens from those cancer cells to the T cell compartment. And it turns out that actually DC1s are very, very good at interacting with dead or dying cells. And that's shown, for example, in this very old video uh, in which we looked at these unlabeled DC1s, these gray shapes, interacting with these clusters of dead or dying uh, cells labeled in red. And you can see that whenever they emerge from these clusters of dead or dying red cells, they have captured a very significant amount of this uh, dead cell uh, material. And that is a source of antigens that these DC1s can then present. Now, why is this relevant in the context of the NGR1, this receptor that we're discussing? Well, it's relevant because it turns out that DNGR1 is a receptor for dead cells. Now, we, when we uh, 
cloned the NGR1, uh, it was extraordinarily similar to another C-type lectin receptor called Dectin-1. Uh, Dectin-1 uh, is a receptor that binds to beta-glucans on yeast and bacterial cell walls. Uh, and we anticipated that the NGR1 might similarly be a receptor uh, that would uh, uh, allow for uh, binding to microbes or perhaps viruses, but that turned out not to be the case. And the only thing that we could find that they bound to was dead cells. And that's shown here where we've taken the c type lacking like domain of the NGL1, and we're using it as a staining reagent for dead cells. We know that these cells are dead because they're permeable to this DNA diatopro. And at that point, they are stainable with this reagent, but not with a control reagent from Dectin-1. And we also know that in response to contact with dead cells, DNGR1 can now signal through this hamitan motif, which contains a tyrosine that gets phosphorylated by SART family kinases. And this now serves as a docking platform for uh, the recruitment of the tandem SH2 kinase SIC. Now, what happens downstream of SIC is something that we have been trying to explore for a great many years, and we still don't fully understand. But unlike Dectin-1 and some other receptors uh, uh, that are able to engage the sick pathway in order to activate myeloid cells, for example, by activating nf kappa b DNGR1, in response to dead cell engagement, does not appear to do that. What it appears to do is it appears to actually promote the cross-presentation of dead cell-associated antigens. And the, that is sort of summarized here, where DNGR1, which is this blue receptor here in this cartoon by Gordon Brown, is interacting with dead cells. And probably in the context of an endocytic compartment or a phagocytic compartment, is signaling via SICK to somehow allow for the contents of this vesicle to be diverted into the MHC class 1 cross-presentation pathway, which would then allow antigens associated with these debris to now be presented to CD8 T cells. And that is one of the main reasons why we also think that this receptor might be very important in the context of anti-cancer immunity, because if this was a dead cancer cell, this receptor would allow for the extraction of uh, tumor-associated antigens and their presentation on MHC class 1 to CD8 T cells that could then uh, eliminate the tumor. Now, how exactly this cross-presentation takes place downstream of the NGR1 is something that we still do not fully uh, understand. And so rather than uh, dwell on that, uh, I thought that I would uh, spend the rest of my talk uh, telling you how we think the NGR1 can recognize dead cells as opposed to recognizing microbes such as Dectin-1 does. And one of the obvious possibilities is that the NGR1 is recognizing a component of cells uh, that is sequestered in live cells, but is exposed when cells die and lose plasma membrane integrity. And that is precisely what happens. It turns out that the ligand for the NGR1 is the actin cytoskeleton or filamentous actin. And what you can see here are in vitro polymerized bundles of actin filaments, which you can uh, identify on the left by staining with this F actin dye. Uh, and you can see that uh, these filaments and bundles of filaments are uh, uniformly decorated with the extracellular domain of mouse or human DNGR1. Now, uh, as you probably uh, all know, uh, F actin is a polymer of G actin, which are the little balls here. Uh, it's a, a double helical uh, uh, filament. And these little balls, the G actin, cannot act as a ligand for the NGR1. Only this filament uh, can act uh, as the ligand. And the reason for that became amply clear 
uh, when we solve the structure of the MGI1 uh, in association with the actin uh, filament in collaboration uh, with uh, Kaichi Numbers uh, Group uh, by Cryo EM. Uh, and so here in blue, you can see a single ligand binding domain, a CTLD of the MGI1. Uh, and it's perhaps easier to see in this reconstruction here. It sits right at the interface between the two protofilaments, making contact with three actin subunits. So this is a binding site that does not exist in the context of the monomeric G actin, only in the context of the polymeric F actin. And we can actually zoom into that structure and we can see precisely where the points of contact are and we can actually mutate the residues on the receptor that make contact with F actin and formally prove uh, that that's how contact is mediated. And so if, <clears throat> if you take this uh, into uh, consideration, then what you have is a fairly simple system that allows for detection of uh, any type of dead cell uh, because that dead cell will uh, expose uh, actin filaments. Uh, these can now be detected by these receptors uh, and possibly in the context of the endosome that contains this debris, uh, that signaling can now divert that endocytic uh, 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 vesicle towards a cross-presentation fate. And for reasons we don't fully understand, not into a DC activation uh, fate. Now, the experiments I showed you use uh, purified F-actin uh, in vitro, uh, but actin, as you probably know in cells, uh, is never naked. It is uh, able to bind um, uh, over 200 different proteins. Uh, and so one of the obvious questions is, what is the role of actin binding proteins in this interaction? Here, does that make a difference? Uh, and we know it won't really make a difference uh, in terms of the actual ligand. We've got the structure of the receptor bound to its ligand, but it might nevertheless influence the triggering of this receptor. And I say this because of this type of experiment here, uh, where we have taken a reported assay for the NGI1 signaling through SICK, uh, and you can see that F-actin will trigger this reporter. But in fact, if we complex F-actin with an F-actin cross-linking protein called myosin 2A, then you see that this triggering is much more effective. The dose response is markedly shifted to the left. And if you look at this in a context of a dead cell triggering the NGI1, uh, you see the same thing. So here we are using a, we're using dead cells as a substrate for DC1s to extract the model antigen or bulbumin from these dead cell debris and cross present it to a uh, obalbumin specific CD8 T cell that then makes interferon gamma. And what you can see is that wild type uh, cells are very good, dead cells are very good substrates uh, for this extraction. But if we get rid of myosin uh, 2A, uh, and that's these cells here, then they are worse substrates. In fact, even removing a single allele of uh, the heavy chain of myosin 2A is sufficient to decrease the ability of these dead cells containing ovalbumin to serve as substrates uh, for cross-presentation by DC1. So what might be going on? We don't think that myosin 2 is a ligand for the NGI1. Uh, what we think it does uh, is uh, summarized in this cartoon here. Uh, and remember I told you that the NGI1 is a dimeric receptor and that means it can actually engage ligand with the two arms of this receptor. And it looks like what myosin 2 does is that it cross-links the actin filaments in just the right spacing to allow for the receptor to be engaged in its dimeric form. Uh, and if you don't have myosin 2, you tend to get predominantly monomeric engagement. And so what you have here is a much more potent agonist, uh, even though the ligand hasn't really uh, changed. And so I think this 
uh, indicates that there is an overall contribution uh, of the uh, actin sided skeleton uh, in allowing uh, for uh, this recognition of dead cells, uh, innate immune recognition of dead cells that can, can then translate into an adaptive immune response through cross presentation. And so, in the last five minutes of, of the talk, uh, I just want to speculate a little bit uh, based uh, on these and other data. Uh, and that really comes from considering what we have found using the NGR1. Uh, and that is something that in retrospect should have been obvious. Uh, we have learned about damage associated molecular patterns from the proposals by uh, Walter Land and Holly Matzinger independently who suggested uh, that the innate immune system should have the capacity to recognize dead cells uh, through exposure of intracellular contents. And if you think about this concept of damps, actin is probably the most uh, obvious one uh, in retrospect, just because it is extraordinarily abundant in all cells. It's ex only found intracellularly uh, unless a cell is dead. Uh, and it's also very conserved throughout evolution. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, actin from yeast and actin from humans is 90% identical. And uh, we know that DNGI1 can bind equally to F actin from yeast and F actin uh, from mammalian cells. And so that led us to wonder whether there is something beyond the NGI1 uh, that is more fundamental and that has to do with an ancient need from the time of evolution of metazoans uh, to recognize damaged tissue. Uh, and perhaps cytoskeletal exposure is one such ancient signal that signifies that you have undergone tissue damage. And perhaps it drives responses, tissue repair or immune responses uh, in organisms, uh, even ones that preceded uh, mammals. And so to start to think about this, uh, we uh, had to uh, move away uh, from uh, systems that have DNGI1 and adaptive immunity uh, and move from uh, mammals to invertebrates, and we chose Drosophila melanogaster, uh, which does not have a DNGI1 ortholog. DNGI1 is only found uh, in uh, mammals. Uh, and so we're not looking here for a DNGI1 receptor. We are looking for the possibility that these organisms might nevertheless respond to cytoskeletal elements uh, and that they might respond to these elements in not quite the same way that they respond to infection, but more in a response that will be akin to a sterile inflammatory response. And I'm not going to show you any data for the sake of time. But we did some very crude experiments of injecting a whole variety of cytoskeletal proteins into adult flies. And we did find that this elicited a response. And that is summarized uh, in this slide here. Uh, and it's all published if you want to look it up. That was a response that actually was systemic. And it was orchestrated by the fat body of the fly, which is the equivalent of the mammalian liver. So it's a little bit akin to the acute response in mammals. And like that response, it involves a cytokine amplification loop where you've got the cytokine called UPD3 acting through this receptor domeless that signals through a STAT pathway to elicit STAT responsive genes. But what was intriguing is that the production of this cytokine appeared to be uh, downstream of a, uh, a recognition of cytoskeletal elements, but it wasn't actin in this case, but rather an actin-associated protein called alpha-actinin that can also be released by dead cells. And we don't know how that alpha-actinin might be recognized. In fact, we don't even know if it's a cell surface receptor. But what was intriguing is the signaling pathway that is utilized here. And look, it involves SARC and it involves SHARC. And SHARC is the Drosophila ortholog of SICK. So it's a very similar signaling pathway to that utilized by the NGR1 uh, 
uh, in uh, mammals. And so what we've uh, concluded from uh, these data uh, is that perhaps cytoskeletal proteins might act as universal damps, even though the exact cytoskeletal protein that acts as a damp might differ in different species. So far we have evidence for F-actin in mammals and alpha-actin in Drosophila. What's interesting is that there appears to be, at least in these two examples, a very similar signaling pathway, a SARC family kinase dependent cascade. Uh, and it is interesting to think about other signaling pathways in innate immunity that are shared between Drosophila and mammals, such as the tall pathway, where the upstream receptors are quite different, uh, but the signaling is quite similar. The outcome also varies. Uh, in uh, the downstream of the NGI1 in mammals, we've got cross-presentation leading to cross-priming. Uh, in the case of Drosophila, so far we've only seen a stat-driven inflammatory response, but that raises the question whether such sterile inflammatory responses are also seen in mammals in response to certain cytoskeletal proteins, and that is an area of interest in our lab. And so with that, and this rather speculative note, uh, I want to end my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. And thank also the people in my lab who've been involved in all this work uh, over the years. Uh, these are the current members of the lab. These are past members of the lab. Uh, both past and current members have contributed to these studies that I've presented today. I'm not going to go uh, through individual contributions one uh, by one uh, just for the sake of time. But I also want to acknowledge the funders who support us and the collaborators uh, who have uh, helped us carry out uh, all of these studies. So thank you again. Um, and I will um, pass the uh, microphone back to Carla and Elena. Thank you so much, Caetano, for such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I think Elena is going to remind us about the questions. Mute myself, okay. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. And uh, okay, let me quickly. Uh, oops. Let me. Oh, is this slide here? Um, do you see the slides again? Yes. Uh, you have to swap the display. And yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cayetano. That was. A spectacular uh, talk, I'm sure it will inspire many, really a beautiful work. Thank you so much. Uh, just uh, uh, before we go to Twitter for the Q&A, and uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of excitement after your talk, um, I would like to uh, give some guidelines so we can concentrate the questions in Twitter in one place so they are easy uh, for Caetano to find. And so uh, just giving three easy steps to ask the questions in Twitter. Eddie, so, you, you, we need you to swap the display. I, we are not seeing your slide. Okay, are you, see. Can you Can you swap? I did, so can you see the slides now? No. Okay. Let's play again. Uh, let's see, maybe. Oh, there, 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 perfect, there you go. Okay, so that's not a presentation, but that's fine. Uh, so basically, this I would like you to follow these three steps. Uh, first, to uh, search for the account named Global Immunotalks. So this is an account that we created in the, in the past few days. Um, and so this has this logo here, uh, the Global Immunotalk logo. And then you find uh, the last tweet in that account that says, ask questions for Dr. Caetano Reyes Sosa seminar here. And then you reply to that tweet with your question and mentioning hashtag global immuno and uh, the handle immuno speaker that this, the, this is the handle that Caetano will use to answer the questions. So again, three very simple steps. First, you search for the account uh, named Global Immuno. Uh, second, you find the last tweet in that account that says, uh, ask questions here. And then you reply to that tweet uh, with your question and mentioning hashtag Global Immuno and the handle 
immuno speaker. So hopefully that will help uh, concentrate the questions in one place and make it easier for Gaetano to find them. And so with that, we would like uh, to close and, and again, thank everyone that have attended. The attendance was again uh, incredible today. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing you again for our uh, next uh, seminar next Wednesday with Hai Ki uh, from Xiwan uh, University in China. Uh, and please help us continue spreading the word so more can benefit. So thank you so much. Thank you, Gaetano, for such an excellent, excellent talk. Outstanding. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.